Hello everyone, and welcome to Jane Austen On Point, historical analysis of dances from Jane Austen adaptations. I'm Cassiety Mobley, and this is part two of my multi-part series on various adaptations of Pride and Prejudice. In this video, we'll be covering the 2005 feature film version of Pride and Prejudice. If you're new here, you can check out my video on the 1995 version of Pride and Prejudice, and I highly suggest watching my video called Five Things That Jane Austen Adaptations Always Get Wrong About the Dancing because it serves as an introduction to everything I cover in this series. As always, for my review, I will give my impression of the film as a whole, share one piece of snark, and then review the dances. But before we get started, I would like to make a point about gatekeeping within the Jane Austen fandom in regards to this adaptation. Some parts of the fandom, especially online, can be particularly cruel and insulting to people who love the 2005 Pride and Prejudice movie, and I don't think that's okay. If you don't like the film, that's fine, but it's not okay to make someone feel bad about liking a harmless piece of media. I'm sick of people accusing fans of this movie of not being real Jane Austen fans. You're allowed to have a deep emotional attachment to an adaptation that made you fall in love with a book, regardless of how much it differs from the source material. A lot of my friends would never have been exposed to Jane Austen if it weren't for the 2005 Pride and Prejudice, and they went on to read all the novels, watch as many adaptations as possible, and developed an interest in history, costuming, and Regency dancing because of that. To my mind, it doesn't matter how you enter a fandom. What matters is that you love the source material and want to have a community with other people who do as well. Plus, the 2005 version clearly functions well as a piece of cinema, regardless of what you think of it as a historically accurate or faithful adaptation. All this to say, like what you like and have friendly debates with each other, but don't be insulting or exclusionary. Oh. And if you couldn't tell, I'm clearly not going to pick on the 2005 version for being historically inaccurate. We all know it's historically inaccurate. Let's move on to something more interesting. Originally, I had intended to include this version along with the 1995 miniseries in a single episode, but I had so much material that I had to split it into two videos. So this video can rightly be thought of as part two of that video. The reason I wanted to directly compare the these two versions of Pride and Prejudice is because they actually have the same choreographer, Jane Gibson, and I'm indebted to dance historian Alison Thompson for pointing this fact out to me. Speaking of Alison Thompson, she's recently written an absolutely amazing book called Dances from Jane Austen's Assembly Rooms, which is full of tunes and dances from the Regency, along with literary quotes about dancing, analysis of dance scenes from all the Jane Austen novels, and tons of interesting historical information. I highly recommend it. Allison is one of the goddesses of Regency dance scholarship, and I frequently use her research in my own videos. I put a link to where you can order her book in the description for this video. Anyway, when I looked up Jane Gibson on IMDb, I saw that not only had she choreographed these two versions of Pride and Prejudice, but she also choreographed all these other Jane Austen films, Sense and Sensibility from 1995, the ITV version of Emma from 1996, Mansfield Park 1999, Persuasion 2007, Mansfield Park 2007, and Becoming Jane 2007. Maybe we should call the 1990s and 2000s the Jane Gibson era of Jane Austen adaptations. Her contributions to historical drama are significant because the quality of dancing in the films she consulted and choreographed represent a significant step forward in terms of historical accuracy. In addition, the fact that there's such inconsistent quality between Jane Austen adaptations that all have her for a choreographer show just how little artistic control that choreographers often have over what actually gets put into production. I know that many of my colleagues who have been asked to choreograph or be a historical consultant for a theatrical production can tell you that it's usually a case of the director having a vision and historical accuracy is a secondary consideration at best. And really, I get it. Their job is to make art, not do historical reenactment. Anyway, all this is to say that when I'm criticizing historical accuracy in the dances, I'm aware that it's not really the choreographer's fault. 
Alright, now let's talk about the 2005 version. I already said I'm not going to harp on this version in general for its historical inaccuracies because they clearly weren't trying to make a historically accurate film. These filmmakers wanted to make this movie to be a costume romance that would appeal to people with minimal exposure to Jane Austen or English history, especially to young adults, and does a great job of doing that. It also captures the story with a fairly high accuracy for a just two hour runtime, and that is not an easy feat. I mean, compare it to the 1940 movie version and you can see just how much of a better job they did. We'll be covering the 1940 movie as a bonus feature later on in the series. Back to the 2005 version. I like the actors playing the Bennett girls and that they look age appropriate in their roles. It especially works at emphasizing how creepy Wickham is for going after Lydia, who's barely 16. Remember that Wickham is the same age as Darcy, which would make him 28. Yikes. The soundtrack for this movie is famously beautiful, and I love their use of historical tunes throughout the film as well. I also think the cinematography is beautiful, and I love all the quiet moments that show the passage of time. I even appreciate their attempts to make Mr. and Mrs. Bennet into less one-dimensional characters. The acting is also great, even though some of the characters differ from how Austen wrote them. And I particularly love Dame Judi Dench as Lady Catherine de Bourgh. That's just perfect casting. One thing I don't like is that they greatly exaggerate the social class difference between the Bennets and Mr. Darcy. In the book, the Bennets are definitely well off, but the problem is that the girls aren't going to inherit any of the money because the estate is entailed through primogeniture. Still, Mr. Bennett has 2,000 a year, and that's nothing to sneeze at. That's what Colonel Brandon has in Sense and Sensibility, and he's considered to be quite a catch. Many social critics of Jane Austen have rightly pointed out that her stories really aren't about class differences. They're mostly about rich women marrying even richer men. So actually, the whole question of how rich is Darcy sent me down an interesting rabbit hole. The note I have from my annotated Penguin Classics edition of Pride and Prejudice says that Darcy's income would put him in the 100 richest families in Britain. The population of Britain in 1800 was 10 million. And if we do the math, that means that Darcy isn't just a 0.1 percenter, he's a 0.001 percenter. Wow. Still, the Bennets are one percenters themselves. I mean, if Mr. Bennett were to die and none of his daughters were married, they would essentially be in the same boat as the Dashwood girls in Sense and Sensibility, which means they definitely wouldn't be destitute, but it would be a significant downgrade. And they still wouldn't be so poor that they'd have to sully their hands with, ugh, work. Still, my problem with this scene is that as rich as Darcy is, he's still not rich enough to live in a house like this with its own sculpture gallery. The house they show for these scenes is called Chatsworth House, and it's the primary residence of the Duke of Devonshire. According to G. E. Mingay's study, British Landed Society in the 18th century, the Duke of Devonshire was one of the seven richest men in England in 1790, with an estimated annual income between 40 and 50 thousand pounds a year. That's four to five times what Darcy makes. There's no way Darcy could afford a house like this. Think of how much your current living space costs, and now imagine paying for something that costs four to five times as much. Yep, ain't gonna happen. So sorry, no sculpture galleries at Pemberley. Darcy is the equivalent of a multi-multi-millionaire, but this house would have required Bill Gates' levels of wealth. I also object because the scenes of the Bennett family house make them look like middling residents of a country town, when in reality they were members of the landed gentry, the rich landowning class, which meant that they owned most of the land and the houses in the surrounding area, and had a manor house on a large estate. Lizzie wouldn't be traipsing across an irrigation canal and walking through the laundry to get back to her house. Anyway, that was a long digression, but I hope it was informative. For Snark, yeah, I'm gonna go with the low-hanging fruit here. Call me crazy, but I really don't like staring at pig genitalia. Anyway, let's talk about the dances now. This is another adaptation like the 2009 Emma, where the good dances are really good and the bad dances are kind of bad. We have three dances here that are plausible for the Regency, four that are not. So already, the percentage is not nearly as good as the 1995 version. 
And speaking of the 95 version, the Meriton Ball scene in this version also looks much better than the Netherfield Ball. Again, I'm blaming the filmmakers for using Baroque music as a cinematic shorthand for snobbery and wealth, even though having old-fashioned music is the exact opposite of what snobs would have done in the Regency. They would have wanted to have all the latest dances from London to show off how fashionable they were. Anyway, there are four dances we get to see at the Meriton Ball. I think I said recently that I thought the Meriton scene was rather good, and I still generally like it, but after a much closer viewing, I have a few more critiques. The first dance we see is a tune and choreography both called Tithe Pig from 1695, which makes it a century too early, but it's not as glaringly bad as a slow Baroque tune, but we'll get to those later. The dance formation is a duple minor, which is not period for the Regency, and neither are the figures, especially the turn singles and the patty cake. The dances do look lively and fun, however, and they tend to use footwork, both of which are good things. I'm kind of baffled and dismayed by the way that they filmed this scene overall, however, because they show dancing for a good 40 seconds before they cut to the dialogue, but they make so many strange cuts that you don't get a very strong sense of the flow or narrative in the dance. I could understand filming it this way if it was a dialogue-heavy scene with characters sitting on the sidelines and the dance going on in the background, but to focus on the dancing itself for that long and not make the dance more intelligible is weird. It's hard for me to see what's going on when it's mostly just close-ups of the characters and the camera constantly cuts to people on the sidelines and weird shots like this. I think what they were trying to convey is a sense of energy and chaos in the ballroom, but I don't think balls were that chaotic even when they were just informal country assemblies. Plus, I'm very much of the Fred Astaire school of dance cinematography that says that the camera should follow the narrative of the dance and not distract from it with quick cuts and weird angles. Also, as an English country dancer, I want to see the choreography. I like being able to imagine doing the dance along with the characters, but I can't see the flow of the figures this way. As much as I've harped on the anachronisms in Mr. Beveridge's Maggot from 1995, I have to say that they filmed that dance beautifully. You can really follow the movement of the dancers in a smooth sequence and, mostly in time with the music, a proficient English country dancer can look at that dance and recreate it perfectly after just one viewing. With this, not so much. Anyway, sorry to digress. I'm just sad that we don't get a better view of the dance. The second dance looks worse than the first. The tune is called Black Bess from 1696, so again, it's a hundred years too old, and the figures they chose to go with it weren't being done in the Regency either. Ironically, the original figures published with this dance would have been more appropriate for the Regency than what they chose, so I'm really baffled by this. And to add insult to injury, this one doesn't have any footwork. This is probably the worst dance from this scene. Also. Did Lizzie just ask Darcy to dance? Okay, I might have a slight rant that ladies weren't allowed to ask gentlemen to dance, but I'll save that for another video. Just tuck that away in your memory. In addition, this is yet another bad edit where the dancers aren't in time with the tune, and that annoys me. The third dance is the big redemption moment. Aside from the fact that they're also kind of not syncing the dance with the tune. Grrr. Anyway. The tune and the choreography were both originally published as The Young Widow in 1788, so it's the right era for both, and it's got footwork, and it looks pretty good overall. I really don't have anything bad I can say about it, apart from the fact that they didn't sync the music properly. The final dance in this scene is Wakefield Hunt, which is also the correct era for the tune and the choreography, so no complaints apart from the usual. Also, good job that the last two dances were triple minors. Yay! All right, so that covers the Meriton Ball. Now let's look at the Netherfield Ball. We see this dance going on in the foreground of the shot when Lizzie first walks in, and the tune sounds really Baroque, and everyone's walking the figures, so that's a fail right there. The dance she does with Mr. Collins is to the tune The Bishop, which is a late 18th century dance, and therefore very plausible for the Regency, but the choreography, again, looks okay, but it has a lot of walking steps. I find the conversation during this dance particularly ridiculous. I explained in my Five Things video that people had conversations during the dance because there was a lot of waiting around built into the structure of Regency-era English country dancing. This happens because of the use of the courtesy start, 
which meant only the top couple and their minor set would have been active to start the dance, and everyone else waited for the active couple to progress down to their position before they started dancing, meaning that most couples had several minutes of waiting in which to converse. There was also opportunity to talk for couples who were progressing up the set because most choreographies only needed two couples but still used a triple minor formation, meaning that one of the couples would be inactive every other round of the dance and would have a minute or so to talk before they started dancing again. Altogether, that's a lot of time standing around for conversation. But filmmakers never stage the dances this way because they think all those inactive couples would be visually boring. And they're right, but the choice to make the dance a simultaneous start with no inactive couples means that conversations have to take place while the couples are in motion, even though that would never happen in the Regency. Because they're not using a courtesy start, Lizzie and Collins start off as active couples, and it's ridiculous to try to have them conversing while they're active, and having Lizzie trying to talk to Jane is even worse, especially since it's not anything Jane can't tell her once the dance is over. And they're distracting each other when Lizzie needs to concentrate on the dance. All right, so let's talk about the Darcy dance. I mentioned in my intro video that this tune is from the 1690s, by Henry Purcell, and it has the same problem as Mr. Beveridge's Maggot from the 95 version, namely that this style of slow, triple-time Baroque music was way, way out of fashion for English country dancing in the Regency. It would be like playing ragtime at a high school prom. So the music is really, really wrong. The formation is also a duple minor, which, as you know, is wrong for the Regency as well. And most of the choreography seems fairly okay in this one, except for this cross right here, which is something that modern English country dance does sometimes, and especially uses for reconstructions of slow Baroque dances like Hole in the Wall or Well Hall. But as far as I know, it doesn't actually have a s historical basis. Anyway, we get one good dance at this ball. It's this one right here. The tune is Dutch Dollars from the year 1800, and these figures were the ones originally published to go with it. Everyone except Darcy and Miss Bingley is doing footwork, and them not doing it is really the only thing that annoys me. When will people understand that nobody walked the figures in the Regency, and really snobby people like Darcy and Miss Bigley were there to show off their fancy footwork rather than pretending to be too cool by not doing it? Still, it's a good dance, and it's a slip jig, and they're dancing it as a slip jig. Are you listening, 2009 Emma? Huh? Huh? Okay, so final reckoning for the dances in this version. Before I get to the final score, I want to reiterate just how much I like what they did with Dutch Dollars and The Young Widow, and I'd wish we'd gotten to see more of Wakefield Hunt, because the little bit we did get to see was pretty good. All three are historical dances from the correct era, are lively, danced as triple minors, and danced with footwork. That's about as good as you're going to get from a film adaptation. I have secret hopes of someday seeing a courtesy start in a Jane Austen adaptation, but I'm not holding my breath. Okay, so final reckoning for the dances in this version. Three of the dances from the correct era with footwork, one from the correct era but doesn't have a lot of footwork, two slow Baroque dances that get zero points, and one dance that's 100 years too early but at least has good footwork, and one that's 100 years too early and is walked. So, three good dances, two mixed bags, and three bad ones. That seems pretty even. So I'm going to give this version a solid three dance slippers. When it's good, it's pretty darn good. So, that's my take on the dancing from the 2005 version of Pride and Prejudice. If you enjoyed it, please hit the like button leave a comment, and subscribe for more dance videos, and share us with your friends. You can also follow us on Facebook and Twitter. We have videos covering dances from five different adaptations of Emma, as well as the 1995 miniseries of Pride and Prejudice. Our next episode, we will be covering the oft-overlooked 1980 miniseries of Pride and Prejudice. Thanks for joining us, and have an ostentatiously good day.